And we're live and on the internet. Hello, everyone watching out there uh, right now on Facebook or perhaps on YouTube or wherever you might find yourself watching this. Uh, it's nice to be with you today. My name is John Lustria. I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Chandra Manning. Thank you for being with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Absolutely. So uh, again, glad to have all of you out there watching with us as well. Um, it's always fun to see where people are watching from. So go ahead and, and drop in the comments uh, where you're watching from. Let us know, um, you know where you're coming to us from. That's always uh, fun to see. Uh, if you enjoy this video and, or you've enjoyed the other videos we've done uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the, one of the great ways that you can help us is by liking this video or maybe even giving it a heart, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat um, and sharing the video. Those numbers let us know that what you like and uh, or perhaps what you don't like. And, uh, uh, and that way we can kind of continue to do more of the content that uh, that you enjoy. Um, so all that, and then, you know, that, that helps boost our numbers and all that good stuff. So liking the video, sharing the video, um, that helps us out immensely. And that's something easy that pretty much everyone watching can do that helps us for free. Um, if you want to take uh, an extra step, um, if you would consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, my uh, colleague, Jake, I think we'll drop that link in the comments that's something else that helps us out immensely. Uh, our lowest level of membership is uh, just $25 uh, a year. That's you know $2 and some change a month. Um, and you know all those memberships add up. Uh, and if you're feeling so inclined, you can give more than that per year. Um, that's all up to you. But um, thank you to those of you who have become a member. Um, I'll shout out my uh, Aunt Connie if she's watching this video. I saw she just renewed her membership. Uh, a little bit and a few weeks ago. So thank you so much for that. Uh, in the comments, I see uh, we've already got about 60 people with us. Uh, Chris from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Janet from Salina, Ohio, Dennis from Millville, New Jersey, Sue from Savannah, Georgia, Sandy from my hometown in Chicago, Illinois, uh, John from Lakeland, Florida, Patricia, Biglerville, Pennsylvania, Sam uh, from Maryland, um, Let's see. Oh, and he says that he saw Dr. Manning uh, years ago at John, Johns Hopkins. So got a, a familiar face, or at least someone that has seen you before out in the crowd, uh, Chandra. So that's exciting. Well, happy to see you again, <laughs> or, or be with you again, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, got people in Iowa, North Carolina, Oregon. We got people all over the country. So it's, it's again, it's great to see people mm -hmm. uh, know that we have people tuning in with us from all over the country. Uh, if at any point you have questions or comments during the uh, our conversation, please drop them in the comments below and uh, we'll get to as many as we can uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, and you're all in for uh, a treat today. We're talking about uh, Chandra's book, Troubled Refuge, Struggling for Freedom in the Civil War. Um, a very appropriate uh, book and topic for this Black History Month. Um, but before we get into that, uh, Chandra, I, I wonder if you just maybe introduce yourself a bit, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then how you came to write this book. How did you, how did you get here? Okay, sure. Um, well, first, thanks, thanks again, John, for the chance to be here. Um, and to all of you for tuning in, I can safely say, especially in these pandemic uh, homebound days, that nobody I live with wants to hear a single word about uh, anything I work on anymore. So it really is a treat to, um, to have a chance to talk with all of you. Uh, I teach 19th century U.S. history at Georgetown University. Um, I commute there when we're not in the midst of a global pandemic uh, from my home, which is outside of Boston. Um, so I usually am there for part of the week and home in Boston part of the week. Through the miracle of Zoom right now, though, um, I'm teaching all my classes a lot like this, you know, um, online. Uh, my, uh, my intense area of professional focus has always been civil war, slavery, and emancipation. Um, every once in a while that will get a little heavy and I need a break and so I will teach a class on the history of baseball because you know we all need a hobby uh, but but I do, live do my you have a, a team that you root for I have to ask. Um, 
Oh, you recall I said that I live outside Boston, right? Yeah, well, I, okay. I wondered, but you know, I just wanted to give you the chance to, to say that I, I'm a White Sox fan myself, so uh -huh. we, we got all the Sox covered here. Exactly. A nice warm beach today. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, carry on. Um, um, uh, the um, Troubled Refuge, as you mentioned, is my second book. I think that the gentleman who I had the chance to meet in Johns Hopkins probably heard me talk about my first book many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I would take a minute uh, to kind of sketch the path from, uh, from that book to this one. It was a path that didn't go anything like I thought it would. Um, and that's usually how these things roll. Um, my first book uh, investigated what Civil War so soldiers thought about slavery. And that book had surprised me because I hadn't really anticipated soldiers thinking anything about slavery. I could read the, you know, the declarations of secession and I could understand the centrality of slavery um, among you know, the political leadership in the Civil War. I did not expect to see concern with it kind of trickle down into the ranks on both the Union and the Confederate sides. Um, when I did find that, it surprised me. <laughs> and so I ended up writing my first book to, to um, understand that surprise a little bit better. One of the findings in that first book was um, how profoundly, in some senses and how limitedly in other senses, Union soldiers found their ideas about slavery impacted by their time. Um, in the in the South, in the states of the Confederacy. Um, I found Union soldiers calling for an end to slavery quite early, much earlier than I had thought, typically within about three months of arriving in the South. And they were calling for that end for largely utilitarian reasons. They saw ending slavery as, as necessary to winning the war and to saving the Union and to having to fight again. Um, and that dynamic, stuck with me. And, and even after I finished the book, I was interested in, in, in understanding why, what about just showing up um, in the South caused the re-examination on the part of soldiers. And one of the, and I was pretty sure that one of the factors was actual interaction with enslaved people, which many of course would not have had before the war, but many did have during the war itself. So that's one ingredient that was sort of floating around in the back of my mind as I finished the first book. I also finished the first book right before the um, bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth and the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Um, so we're talking about 2009, 10, 11, 12, right around those early years um, of the first decade of the 21st century. Um, and if you were in my line of work in those years with a bicentennial and a sesquicentennial going on, you tended to get a lot of invitations to come speak places. It's probably how I met our friend at Johns Hopkins, in fact. Um, so I was getting these invitations and usually I was asked to talk about emancipation and citizenship. Um, great stuff. You know, I was thinking about soldiers and, and, and interactions with slaves and emancipation citizenship. This should be no problem. I should be able to talk about emancipation and citizenship, no problem at all. And then I started preparing to have something to say. And I realized that I actually wasn't sure what to say. I was finding myself all tied up in knots. And I realized that one of the reasons for that was that um, emancipation and citizenship were not the same thing. That in my mind, they had kind of conflated, but I was wrong about that, that they were two really distinct processes. And I really needed to understand both of them. So once I realized that, I went back to this, where was it that um, that soldiers, Union soldiers were encountering enslaved people. And by and large, it was in these places called contraband camps, um, uh, which were uh, encampments um, that enslaved people in the Confederacy ran to when the Union army was around uh, to try and escape slavery, to get away from their owners. And it occurred to me that um, maybe those camps were a place to look to understand better what are both of these things, emancipation and citizenship. Um, and so I dove into those camps and I promptly got lost there to, to tell you the truth. Um, there were a lot of them. The story in them was complicated and complex and hard to get at um, and so multifaceted. And for a time, I thought I was never going to find any kind of unifying narrative thread. I thought I was going to be stuck in these camps forever, and I was never going to get out with anything to say. 
Um, and when I was struggling in this state of lostness, I encountered the story, it sticks with me so strongly, I encountered the story of a woman in North Carolina. And she made her way to a, um, a contraband camp uh, outside of New Bern, North Carolina. She did it by putting her children and a basket of eggs into a canoe and then walking that canoe 12 miles along the North Carolina coast to get to freedom. And her story just really stuck with me. And what really stuck with me was the idea of eggs, something so fragile in a canoe rocked by the sea with small children in it. If those small children were mine, they would have broken the eggs in like 30 seconds flat. Um, the, I couldn't make sense of this very affecting episode. What would happen to her? She had no idea what would happen to her when she left. What if she was captured? What if the sea got rough? What if the eggs broke? What if once they got there, she or her children became ill? When she took the step to leave, she had no idea of knowing what the destination would be or, what, or how her story would end. And she finally made me see in a way that I had not seen before that that sense of the unknown and of danger and of risk was absolutely essential to the experience of emancipation. That to leave slavery, to exit slavery, was to take steps into the unknown, to face danger, to have no idea what the outcome was going to be, and to do it anyway. And that insight finally opened the way um, to write this book about um, contraband, contraband camps as sites of both emancipation and citizenship, even though those were two different things. Yeah, that's uh, quite a compelling story. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the message that you, or one of the messages you draw from it, I think is so important for us to remember. And it's so easy to forget. We know the ending of a lot of these yes. stories because we weren't living them. I mean, exactly. it, it's, it's, you know, history 101, the people living at the time didn't know how it was going to end. It's so right. easy for us to forget that. But that's a great point that, that you draw there and can't be underscored enough. Um, a lot of good stuff to to unpack there. And, and I, that's, you know, I think so clever. It's, it's sitting right there, this distinction between citizenship and emancipation. And it's, you know, on the surface, they seem like the same thing, but all you have to do is look at it for you know more than a minute, and you say, okay, maybe they're not exactly the same thing. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that as we we go along. But to talk about these camps uh, that you got lost in, um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you sort of a series of questions sure. um, that are all kind of related. So tell our viewers, you know, what exactly were they? Mm -hmm. uh, who's living in them? Where were they? And what is it about them that really helps us see something different um, about the Civil War era? Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to, to answer these questions. When I first began the, this work on contraband camps, um, you know, th there wasn't all that, they, they weren't very well known. I mean, scholars knew they existed for sure, but um, I remember giving early talks about contraband camps and seeing puzzled looks on people's faces. And it turned out that when they heard contraband, they were thinking of like blockade running. And so they had visions of, you know, camps full of Cuban cigars that had run the blockade or something. Um, so, uh, so you are starting in the right place, which is what is a contraband camp? Why is it called that? Um, and the story of how contraband camp, that the uh, sort of contraband camp noun definition is a contraband camp is essentially a refugee camp. Um, and it's a refugee camp uh, filled with enslaved, formerly enslaved men, women, and children who ran to the Union Army during the Civil War everywhere the Army, the Union Army went within the occupied Confederacy. That strange name, Contraband Camp, has its own backstory. And that goes back to May of 1861. And, um, and it goes back to Fort Monroe in Virginia. Fort Monroe is a U.S. Army installation dating back to defenses connected to the War of 1812. It, even though it's located, still located in um, within the state of Virginia, and even though Virginia seceded, there were U.S. forces at, at Fort Monroe at the time that Virginia seceded. So the fort itself stayed in Union hands. It was always um, 
Um, it was always in the hands of the Union Army. So May of 1861, here's this outpost of the Union Army surrounded by Confederate territory. That Confederate territory is itself preparing for war. And so an owner of enslaved people who lived in Hampton or outside of Hampton, Virginia, which is contiguous to Fort Monroe, uh, was required by the Confederate Army to provide labor for the Confederate Army. So he decides that he is going to send um, three of the people he owns, um, Frank Baker, uh, James Townsend, and Shepard Mallory. He's going to send them uh, south towards Richmond to work on Confederate Army fortifications. Doing that will separate the men from their families. And so the men decide, for that's it, last straw, we're not doing it. And they run to the Union Army at Fort Monroe in Virginia, and then make it inside the fort. Uh, well, uh, the Confederate Colonel Mallory discovers that um, the men are gone, and he sends an agent to the Union officer in command, Benjamin Butler, at Fort Monroe, and tries to invoke the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Uh, to, um, to to induce General Butler to reduce to pardon me to return the three men to claim you know Fugitive Slave Act law of the land it says that when my enslaved people run away you have to give them back to me. Well, Butler was a lawyer and a clever one at that and an opportunist and so those two parts of his personality came together in this moment, and those two parts of his personality said well hang on just a minute. You can't rebel against the laws of the land and then try to invoke one of them for your own benefit. Um, you claim to be out of the union. You have therefore relieved me of any duty to, uh, to, um, to abide by the Fugitive Slave Act in your case because you are claimed to be out of the union. Furthermore, you claim that these people are your property and the international laws of war permit me to confiscate enemy property um, if it's being used for enemy war effort. You're the ones who say the property so confiscated. These guys are contraband of war and you cannot have them back. Um, so Butler was, uh, Butler was essentially using Confederate insistence on slaves as property to carve a way out of slavery, carve a way out of the status as property for these three men. They stayed, in other words. Um, word spread very fast. And within three weeks, over 800 men, women, and children had come to Fort Monroe in the expectation that they would not be sent back, that they would find refuge with the Union Army. And so the name contrabands from Butler's clever contraband of war um, answer, that name contraband stuck. It, it, it did the 1861 version of going viral. It became sort of a slang term for men, women, and children who ran to the Union Army. And so that's where contraband comes from. And then the camps where they lived, the refugee camps, were contraband camps. So that's how they got their name. And, and it's it's worth noting too that, you know, this term contraband, you know, they're they're, you know, using the kind of Southern logic of treating these people as property as a way to sort of, you know, help them in, in this sense. But talking in a legal sense, that's like very much a gray area. So they might, you know, maybe are no longer slaves, but they're definitely not uh, free or citizens. Um, so talk about how that, that, how they navigated that space and how citizenship, you know, this discourse over citizenship, emancipation comes into the, into the picture eventually. Uh, Talk about that evolution. Sure, you're right that when 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 Butler makes this makes this essentially this this you know you one-handed um, um, unilateral decision, uh, what he does is prevent these individuals from getting sent back to their owners. So these individuals have now exited slavery. What he has not done though is answer any questions about what comes next. His answer doesn't determine if not if not slaves. Who are these people? And in fact, in um, the sort of legal and constitutional traditions of the United States at that time, he couldn't because those were civil questions. Those were matters for civil law. He was a, 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 an army officer. So military authority could not determine um, the status, um, at least in the thinking of the time. You know, Americans at the time had very, very deep reservations about blurring the lines between civil and military authority. They felt very strongly that civil authority had always to trump military authority, except in cases of 
outright war, which is how we'll get the Emancipation Proclamation later. But, but in the early days, um, nobody is entirely clear what legal status now affixes to people who have exited slavery through this military pathway as, as contrabands. All that has decided is that they're not slaves. It has not decided whether they are fully free. And it certainly hasn't determined what, if any, relationship they might now have to the United States government. So it has created a, what, what you rightly call a gray area. And it is in this gray area that formerly enslaved people themselves start to answer the questions and start to build the case um, for their full inclusion within US citizenship. It is not Butler who decides that. It is not even things like the Emancipation Proclamation that, that, that decide who they are. Um, it is their own actions in these camps over the course of four years that will create a brand new idea of what citizenship is that affects us to this day. And it is actually the product of, of people in camps. But right now what we're doing, I think, is we're jumping that emancipation citizenship um, uh, pathway again. So I think maybe we want to slow down the action a little bit. And I realized I skipped a few of your first questions. You had asked about where camps were and what were they like. Um, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't contain myself. I got too excited. <laughs> oh, no, no. That was on me, not you. I, I have that effect. Um, I was just going to say, does it make sense, do you think, for us to sort of go back and cover some of those details? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, such as where they were and, um, you know, what taking a close look at these camps, you know, what it reveals to us. Right. The camps were essentially wherever the Union Army was. If the Union Army showed up, then it did not take very long before enslaved people started running to the Union Army. Um, word of what happened at Fort Monroe spread. It spread very quickly. Um, and it spread wherever the Army was. So uh, geographically, to put a map in your mind, in the Eastern theater of the war, the Union Army took and maintained territory along the coasts pretty quickly. Uh, so wherever the Union Army uh, maintained a presence, so Fort Monroe, um, all the way down the Virginia coast through um, uh, uh, New Bern and um, uh, Beaufort, North Carolina, through down into the Sea Islands of South Carolina, off the coast of Charleston, and even um, even into uh, uh, off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, and the very, very tip of the northern coast of Florida. If you can envision the Union Army as a line along that coastline, then contraband camps sprung up all along that line. And they stayed there pretty much for the duration of the war because Union troops stayed there. The picture in the Western theater of the war is a little different because the army was more mobile there. Camps still followed the Union Army and the Union Army followed chiefly rivers and railroad lines. So camps in the Western theater of the war were along the Mississippi Valley and along railroad lines. For example, Corinth, Mississippi was an important railroad junction. Union Army held that junction for quite some time. And when they did, there was a contraband camp there. But because troops in the West moved more, um, not in places like New Orleans, there were camps they stayed throughout the war, uh, but throughout Mississippi, throughout the Tennessee Valley, the Union Army um, would advance and retreat. And so camps in those places were, were more temporary. They would take shape when the Union Army showed up, and then they'd have to up stakes and move when the Union Army moved. Um, so you can imagine the Western theater of the war a little bit like a kaleidoscope, where every time something changes in the war, the kaleidoscope shifts and where the camps are move a little bit, but they're always along rivers and railroad lines, chiefly. Uh, and now is actually a good time. Got a, a few uh, good questions from the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, we got about 80 people watching with us. Wow. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, Erica uh, says, excellent presentation. Uh, she clarifies many points. So you're doing a good job so far. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. <laughs> uh, Chris asked an interesting question. Uh, were there refugees and refugee camps in uh, Indian territory or any refugees connected to Indian territory? Um, can you speak to that at all? Um, not Indian territory. Uh, it, um, 
I, I think what Chris might be asking about is, can we draw lines between contraband camps and say a reservation system that, 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 that comes a bit later? Um, and we can't draw direct connected lines um, because um, even though there are, of course, US Army forces in the West during the war, um, formerly enslaved people don't head that far. Um, to, to, to run is to take enormous risks. And so what you're going to do is run to whoever is closest to you. So the, so the wartime contraband camps um, really do center on the East Coast and then the Mississippi Valley. Um, and uh, uh, after the war, you know, a fair bit after the war, there, there will be sort of um, uh, migrations of former slaves who head west and the story gets a bit different there. It's a, it's a different dynamic. Um, so Chris is right to perceive some parallels, um, but the parallels are more parallels than direct connections, largely because of geography and risk. Gotcha, that makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, now, when taking close looks at these places, uh, what sort of things, you know, do they reveal? How do they expand our understanding of uh, the Civil War, the experience of, uh, you know, African Americans at the time? One of the things they did for me, I think, was, was really help me think more about the experience of emancipation. I mean, emancipation is on one thing, a big national event for the United States to transform from a slaveholding to a non-slaveholding nation. It's a revolutionary change on a political and economic level. Um, but what does it mean at the same time to be a person exiting slavery? What does it mean to go from enslavement to not enslaved anymore? Um, that's a different story and that's a different question. And I think that the camps give us a place to see one version of that, um, of that transition. Not every enslaved person went through a contraband camp. In fact, about one seventh of the population, um, the, um, um, actually made its way through a contraband camp. We're pushing towards half a million people. That leaves, you know, that leaves another three million people who experienced emancipation in a different way. So I don't want to sound like I'm talking about everybody, but you know, it's a good 15% or so, I would say, of the um, of of enslaved people experience emancipation by going through a contraband camp. Um, and the best parallel I can think of to try and evoke what these places are like as places is to um, turn on the TV or the internet and take a look at a refugee camp anywhere in the world today, Dadaab or Syria, and then take away the Red Cross because that didn't exist yet, and take away the UN because that didn't exist yet, and take away any notion of sort of professional humanitarian aid because that didn't exist yet either. So imagine the crowding and imagine the poor sanitary conditions because these places crop up. They're not carefully planned in advance. They occur where people run to. So imagine poor sanitation, imagine overcrowding. Um, imagine most of the people in them have gotten there after taking enormous risks to run. They could have gone days without food. Uh, Confederacy is experiencing food shortages. So they could have been you know, malnourished even before they left. So people arrive in weakened condition um, without belongings um, to uh, refugee camps. And the only authority around to oversee them is an army. Armies exist to fight and win wars. Armies make terrible humanitarian organizations. Um, so conditions in, it's just not what they exist to do. That's, that, that's, that's not their rule. And so conditions in most of the camps are, are truly dreadful. They are like instant cities, they are disease, in, in, in the disease incubation sort of um, sense of the term without infrastructure. Um, so conditions, um, we're, we're, we're speaking from the, the uh, uh, Museum of Civil War Medicine, it was a medicine nightmare uh, to, to, to be in one of these camps. Um, uh, supplies, uh, there's a constant shortage of supplies and of shelter and of clothing. Um, and the army will provide those things out of its um, surplus, but its first job is to fight the war. And so the best tents are gonna go to the soldiers, not to former slaves. Um, uh, and formerly enslaved men can certainly wear sort of surplus union uniforms, but that's not going to clothe a child. It's not going to clothe a woman. And there's no reason for the army to have, you know, children's clothing or women's clothing on hand. 
So uh, they're humanitarian nightmares, especially at first. Um, eventually, uh, there will be a humanitarian response growing first and foremost out of the free black community in the north um, second out of um, northern churches and then third there will be organizations the United States Sanitary Commission things like the Freedmen's Aid Society there will be eventually an institutional response um, but a lot of suffering has happened before that um, so uh, they're pretty dreadful places by and large the ones that stick around for a long time when the immediate threat of, um, a, of a Confederate army nearby abates and they have room to like spread out a little bit, they do begin to build essentially towns. Um, they make their own streets, they elect their own officers. So there are some that begin to function like autonomous communities. It was very different to be in one of those camps, Corinth, Mississippi, for example, turns into a little town. It was very different to be in a camp like that compared to um, a camp where people are crowded into tents or under shelters made from twigs where there's not enough food and there's a diphtheria epidemic. And I say that to say that one of the things we see better about emancipation, I think, by looking at camps is how widely that experience varied. That what it was like to leave slavery depended an awful lot on where you were and when you did it. So my idea that I was going to be able to say something about the experience of emancipation writ large really crumbled or atomized into thousands of particulars because it varied a lot depending on where you were. But the common factors for sure were risk and danger, um, including a danger, to go back to your point about we know the end, they didn't, including a danger that, that um, we overlook a lot, but I think camps help us to see, and that is the danger of re-enslavement. Prior to the Civil War, most wars in human history had resulted in more slaves, not fewer. Besides the Haitian Revolution, you really don't, you'd be hard pressed to find an example of a war that led to permanent emancipation for people. Maybe some wartime manumissions, they're often undone after the war. The threat of re-enslavement um, was just as high and just as acute as the nearest Confederate troops. Um, that's, that's why camps move so often in the, in the Western theater, because if they get round, if, if the Confederate army comes through, these people will find themselves back in slavery. Um, so I think that we see the risk. I think we see the danger. I think we see the humanitarian suffering of emancipation in these camps. And we are also reminded quite acutely that nobody knew for sure that slavery was going to be abolished permanently, that the possibility of re-enslavement was um, was a live possibility. It was a real danger uh, for people throughout the course of the war. And, and to me, at least, that was an element of emancipation um, that I don't think I appreciated fully until I really dove into these camps. Yeah, and you're, you're pointing to, you know, the experience of emancipation is uh, another a point that I associate with Jim Down's book, mm -hmm. Sick from Freedom, which is right. just fantastic. Um, we interviewed him on this channel uh, a, a while back, so you can go back and watch <laughs> that video. And I should note, if you're just tuning in and you missed the beginning, uh, if you wait till the end of this, you'll be able to rewatch this video uh, <laughs> here on, on the Facebook page, so never fear. Um, but it, it's, it's such a great point, you know, emancipation a wonderful thing but in the short term the question it doesn't answer for the newly emancipated person is well where am i going to sleep right. um, and things of that nature um uh, an, an explosion of questions in the comments you know we'll get to as many as we can uh, some of which you've actually already spoken to uh, one from janet uh, about how were refugees in contraband camps fed and clothed and in some cases they weren't <laughs> um, which is sort of what you were you, you were speaking to there. Um, let me see here. And then another question that you spoke to a little bit uh, from Cody. Uh, do you know, uh, you know, an estimated number of how many in, uh, formerly enslaved people who escaped to these camps died, uh, were recaptured, or successfully escaped to freedom? Um, and my guess is we probably don't have, you know, too many firm numbers uh, because the conditions varied so widely between these camps, but uh, anything you want to say to that point? Um, we, our best, guess, you're, you're right about the fuzziness of the numbers. Um, it, it's, uh, um, 
there just there isn't an office of refugee camps. There isn't somebody whose job it is to be keeping track of these numbers, um, which they have our soldiers who have a war to fight. So so the specifics get lost a lot. What what we have done, where, where my number between 450,000 and 500,000 comes from, um, uh, are our, our, our best estimates based on some spot censuses that that um, that every so often a particular camp commander or a chaplain or somebody um, will, will try to do account for where they are. And Congress will sometimes ask, um, Congress in 1860s, well, the War Department and then Congress together in 1863 authorized something called the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission. Um, and that commission sends agents to contraband camps um, to, to try and get a sense of how many people are here, what are conditions like, um, that is Congress and the War Department realizing we have this, we have this unforeseen um, or at least inadequately planned for humanitarian crisis on our hands, what do we do about it? Uh, so we do start to get some numbers um, from those inquiries later in the war. And that's where the 450 to 500,000 numbers come from. Um, uh, I don't know of anybody who has a good, like, solid, reliable overall mortality figure. Um, I I would put it though at roughly double the mortality figure for soldiers. And the reason why I would do that is because there are people in similar conditions, but arriving there in weakened states and with second. Um, you know, second and not first access to things like medicine and um, food and clothing. Um, uh, so I, I fully recognize that that is an unsatisfactory answer to your uh, to your inquirer, but uh, but but that's that is my that that's my sort of rule of thumb about double the mortality rate for soldiers. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. So in, a, in the museum here in Frederick, um, which we'd encourage everyone to come visit, we are now open uh, by reservation. There's a form you can fill out on our website if you want to reserve a time to come in. So um, you can do that. Um, but in the museum, we have a gallery uh, about camp life during the Civil War, and it's sort of set up to point towards, you know, the challenging conditions in regards to disease um, in, you know, army camps. But as you're saying here, and as we say, you know, when we do tours through the museum, um, it just as easily applies to refugee camps, or for the most part, any large gathering of human beings sure. in the 19th century. Um, you know, with the lack of knowledge of germ theory and the way infrastructures were and were not set up, um, any large gatherings of people for any period of time um, led to some challenging um, results in terms of disease. Yes. Um, Nobody was talking about social distancing, I can assure you of that. <laughs> no, no, very few. Although they did have some sort of understanding of quarantine. That um, is true. You're right about that. Yeah. When it uh, when it comes to smallpox and and yeah. you know diseases like that. So you know the and not to go off on too much of a tangent, but the, the Civil War is this really fascinating kind of pivot point where in some ways they resemble modern medicine quite a bit. In other ways, they it's like they have no idea what they're doing. It's, <laughs> it's so bizarre. It's both at the same time. Um, anyway, um, another question um, from Diane, which actually lines up with um, sort of a question I was uh, going to ask here. Uh, she asked, where are the records of these camps if they even exist? You spoke to that a little bit. And my follow-up question is, you know, when you're writing this book, where did you go to for sources? And specifically, how do you get the voice of the, uh, the refugees themselves uh, in there, which I'm sure was not easy? Right, no, both you and Diane are putting your finger right on. The, the, one of the central challenges of this project and one of the reasons I got lost in these camps for so long, um, that first book on soldiers' letters, um, it wasn't hard to figure out how to you know, get access to the ideas of common soldiers. Every state archives in the union has you know, soldiers' letters from up and down the economic spectrum. I read people's mail, that was pretty easy. Um, but that won't work for this project because you know most states had laws outlawing slave literacy and even if an enslaved person had figured out how to read and write there's not a steady supply of pens and inks in contraband camps so um, uh, there are very few as you might guess um, firsthand you know long diaries of somebody about what it was like to be in the contraband camp so what to do instead because those are indeed the voices i most want to hear um, 
And the way that I began, I sort of came to thinking about here, listening for voices and finding evidence for this project was to think in terms of a mosaic um, with some teeny tiny pieces and some slightly larger pieces that had to be very carefully fitted together. The slightly larger pieces, you're right, I alluded to a minute ago, um, the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission, um, the idea of Edwin Stanton in the War Department authorized by Congress, um, sends agents to uh, uh, camps throughout the occupied Confederacy and um, interviews people in the camps, interviews commanders, interviews sort of um, uh, religious uh, workers who are in the camps, but also interviews some of the formerly enslaved people themselves in camps and compiles more than a thousand handwritten pages of testimony. Um, though that testimony will become the basis for a published report by the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission. And we've known about the lots of people have used that published report. Um, that is where the idea for the Freedmen's Bureau, for example, came from, was the commission reported back and Congress used that information to create the Freedmen's Bureau. But the raw data itself, those handwritten transcriptions of interviews, those haven't been used very much. Um, so I drew very heavily on those. And they're fascinating for a number of reasons. Um, one to me that really stands out is that contrary to 19th century practice, the answers of formerly enslaved people are not rendered in dialect. They are written in exactly as everybody else is written. So you have to read pretty carefully to figure out who is and is not an enslaved person. And that's interesting. I'm not sure what to make of that, but it's different from most, um, most white renderings of African-Americans in the 19th century. So that's one major source. Um, I also looked to Army records a lot. The Army wrote down everything. The Army wasn't interested in the same things as I was, so it's not like I could find, you know, the contraband camp collection in the Army. But what I could do is go through commissary records and notice, oh, there's a big jump in, um, say, rations that this particular camp is, is requesting at this time, and there's no new troops coming. Let me go check the... Um, let me go check the, the quartermaster records and see who's coming into camp at this time. And I might find that 500 people arrived from, from surrounding plantations that night. I've just found 500 more who, um, who showed up. So cross-referencing commissary records and quartermaster records. Um, provost marshal's records were also um, uh, not always, uh, theoretically should have always been useful. The problem is that you don't always find what you want, but um, theoretically when enslaved people entered a contraband camp, they first went to the provo marshal to be interviewed um, to make sure they weren't a, spy, a Confederate spy and then to share any um, local intelligence that they might have. Um, some of those interviews have survived. Sadly, not all of them, but or, or if they have, they're lost in the National Archives, and I haven't found them. But, uh, but, uh, but, but, but there are quite a few that are in Provost Marshall's record. So that's another source. Um, certainly, Union soldiers stationed in a near contraband camps write their perspective home. Um, that's through a white soldier's eyes, and that needs to be kept in mind. But, um, uh, but soldiers' letters was another source. Um, when aid workers from the north begin to go into the camps, they will also write letters home and they will also need to send reports back to, for example, the American Missionary Association sponsors um, aid workers to go into contraband camps. And those workers need to send reports back to the American Missionary Society. So that's another source. Um, two post-war sources that uh, uh, turned out to tell me more than I thought they would were Freedman Savings Bank records. Um, yeah, uh, after, uh, during the war, um, the army starts this sort of informal, um, like savings mechanism for black union soldiers to, to keep their pay so that, um, so that, uh, they don't get cheated out of it essentially. Uh, and then after the war that will morph into the Freedmen Savings Bank, which is a bank, um, as it sounds like for, form, for former slaves. And there are branch offices in several cities, um, not through the whole South, but through the Eastern part of the South, at least. Uh, it sadly would go bankrupt after the depression of 1873, which bankrupted a lot of United States banks. But in the years it existed from 65 to 73, um, when people opened an account, uh, 
they were also given a space to describe others who should have access to their accounts. So those records, those, those records of people opening savings bank accounts will often narrate family relationships. So it's sometimes um, that somebody will self-identify as, um, uh, as um, a soldier, but he also wants his aunt and his wife and her two children to have access to this account, which helps me begin to draw the links who met who in these camps. So that's another source, those Freedman Savings Bank records. Um, and then pension records, Black soldiers' pension records. Um, and the reason why those are such good sources, um, the best ones um, for talking about life in camps are uh, pension applications on the part of Black Union soldiers, widows, or orphans. Um, because to get a widow's or orphan's pension, you needed to prove you, had, you were the wife or child of a deceased service member, which for white Union soldiers means that you show a birth certificate or you show a marriage certificate. But an enslaved person, of course, didn't have a marriage certificate and didn't have a birth certificate to those things didn't exist in slavery. So to demonstrate um, relationship to uh, a deceased Black Union soldier, they had to give an affidavit. They had to find a notary public and they had to describe their relationship to the person and usually what they did during the war. And so sometimes you will find um, long narratives about people's contraband camp experiences in widows and orphans pensions files for uh, Black Union soldiers. And then other things of uh, newspapers and um, the Atlantic Monthly had a correspondent who was interested in these camps and, and, and wrote accounts. Um, those are other types of sources. Um, and so it was a lot of finding a little piece and putting it here and putting it together and putting it, and putting it there. It took some doing to hear those voices, but if you listened really hard, you could. Yeah, uh, definitely a lot of pieces in all kinds of different areas. And it's, it's such a great point that I think often goes, you know, unsaid, the work of historians that um, more often than not, you know, probably 99% of the time, you know, the sources you're looking at are not really interested in the exact same thing that you exactly. are. Exactly, right, um, right, there's so a lot you, of reading between lines. <laughs> exactly, so um, it's, it's, it's definitely worth noting, so yeah, that's pretty incredible, you know, uh, looking at all those nooks and crannies and, and things like that, so. Uh, and it definitely comes through uh, in the book that you you did do all of that looking. <laughs> um, a lot of a lot of good questions in the comments here. Um, a question from Brian, uh, and this is sort of a, a specific question, but one that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, he asked, "Do you know much about the gray area period between the ending of slavery in Washington D.C. and the abolition of slavery in Maryland in November 1864? Uh, were contraband camps, you know, safe within uh, the District of Columbia, or this Maryland area, these border state areas mm -hmm. where slavery is sort of technically legal for uh, longer than it is elsewhere?" Um, thank you, Brian. That is actually a, a great question. It, it, it picks up on this, it really mattered where you were um, theme. Um, and you, you put your finger on a, a great example of a place where, where location really mattered, because you're right um, that slavery remained legal in Maryland. Maryland stayed in the Union. So the, um, the contraband of war logic did not apply there. Um, so uh, uh, there aren't contraband camps, therefore, really in Maryland, because it didn't do you any good to get there. Um, the one example being, oh, what's the name of the prison? Sandy Point, I think. Um, Sandy Point Prison um, is held, it's a union, uh, it's, a, it's a union uh, post in Eastern Maryland. There's a Confederate prisoner of war camp there. And that ends up functioning as sort of a, a, a contraband camp. But by and large, Maryland is not where to go if what you wanna do is get out of slavery. Washington DC in contrast, as you know, it does emancipate in April of 1862. And um, so you know, tens of thousands go to DC um, as a result. DC itself um, uh, developed a, a contraband camp um, uh, it, near what is now Logan Circle, it would grow, it would become what we think of as the U Street District actually began as Camp Barker. Um, and then other uh, areas surrounding DC on the Virginia side, Alexandria, Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, camps do um, sprout up there. Maryland, however, um, uh, was a no-go zone uh, for the formerly enslaved. And so one thing that I, that, that recurs again, and again, in both 
the voices of the formerly enslaved in DC or of camp officials in DC is how um, how much freed people dreaded Maryland, uh, that, that, that they saw that to be dragged to Maryland was to be dragged back to slavery. Um, and so this distinction between your fate in DC or Virginia and your fate in Maryland, I think um, gray area is a super way to talk about um, that fate because that distinct, that, that gray area in your fate um, explains why just getting out of slavery isn't the only thing that these that free people want in, in these camps. And they start to use these camps as places to build a direct relationship with the United States government. It's a relationship that we call citizenship. Because if you can make the claim of citizenship, then that gray area becomes a lot less gray for you. You are in a gray area when you have no claim on the US government, when you are no longer enslaved, but not a citizen of the United States government, you lack the protection of a state behind you. You lack the protection of a government and you are vulnerable to re-enslavement either by getting dragged to Maryland. Um, that's, that, that, that's a concrete sort of thing that can happen to you. Uh, but again, going back to this idea that if you're living during the war, you aren't sure if emancipation is gonna last after the war. So you really want to build a direct relationship with this, with this entity, the United States government, uh, to safeguard your claim on, um, on citizenship. They do it in DC to protect themselves against Maryland. They do it in camps everywhere. And what do they do? They make themselves indispensable to the Union war effort. Um, breed people um, uh, in, in contraband camps become the nurses and they become the laundresses and they become the teamsters and they become the spies. They know the surrounding area so much better than the Union Army does. Um, they become the people who dig the ditches and who build the, um, the walls of the forts and who um, feed the, uh, uh, who feed the um, the horses of the cavalry. They become the people who repair grain sacks. I never thought about this. A grain sack really matters to an army because it can't go anywhere if it can't feed its horses en route. Uh, so there are this is a group of women on, in Craney Island, Virginia, who repair about 500 grain sacks. Um, and when they do, suddenly the army can move again, which it couldn't before. And so in these ways throughout the occupied Confederacy, um, formerly enslaved people in these camps uh, make themselves useful, they make themselves necessary to the Union Army. And so doing are contributing to the war effort, are contributing to the Union victory. And on the basis of that victory, every bit as much as Black soldiers would be able to lay claim to citizenship on the basis of fighting, those in camps can lay claim on the basis of their labor, of their contribution to the Union Army cause. And that claim is critical. That claim changes what we think of as citizenship. In 1857, before the war, the Supreme Court had said African Americans could not be citizens. It was a categorical no. Um, yet the actions of this pe these people in camps blew that out of the water and really, um, really created a, a, a new sense of what a citizen is and who is entitled to citizenship. And it's a sense that that really we live and we're beneficiaries of it. Yeah, that's uh, I, I I love that you know the the whole thing that you know they're they're taking it upon themselves to to do this and in doing so demonstrating uh, an immense amount of political savvy. Um, and yeah, for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, in you know this effort to make themselves indispensable uh, and even you know avoiding Maryland as much as they can, you know, be, even though it's, you know, we mentioned earlier that these camps sort of spring up where the Union Army is, and, you know, I'm sure there are plenty of Union troops, you know, in Maryland, but yeah. you know, the fact that the camps don't spring up there is, is just, I think, very notable. Um, yeah, and, and thank you for getting us back to that, that citizenship track that we kind of, uh, you know, we've, <laughs> we've touched on at various points, but yeah, that's, that's uh, such a great point about you know, the importance of citizenship and, you know, what, um, you know, what lets you merit being a citizen and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, it's a, a vitally important question in, uh, you know, 
a, a republic. Um, right. You know. And Brian's question about gray, gray areas was just the right setup for it because it's the opposite of a gray area. You're in a gray area when you're not enslaved, but your status is unclear. When you have no, when you cannot make a claim on a government to protect your basic rights to, um, to you know, life and and liberty and and, and all that stuff, um, you're vulnerable. You're, you're you're vulnerable. This gray area is is sort of synonymous with being vulnerable. Um, so so Brian's question about gray area um, really put his finger right on what is the distinction between emancipation and citizenship and how do you get from one to the other? The distinction is emancipation is a very gray area. Uh, citizenship is not. Citizenship is the other side of that gray area. And how did they get there? They got there through con direct contributions to the union war effort. So as we uh, we start to wind down here, uh, I know there's there's a ton of other good questions in the comments we didn't have time to get to. Um, in the the days after this, uh, I'm sure uh, Jake and myself um, will will go through some of these and and you know try and reply to them as, as best we can. But as we wind down, Chandra, uh, one of the things I, I love to ask people that have you know written books, which is a Herculean task. Um, in order to do something like that. I have immense respect for anyone that writes really any book. Um, uh, but, you. you know, people that have, that have written books, you know, now once they're out in the world, in some ways they kind of take a life on uh, of their own. But you as the author, uh, what is your hope um, for someone who picks up a copy of Troubled Refuge? Uh, what do you hope they, they take away from it? I hope they take away um, an ex a, a sharper sense of the experience of emancipation that... Um, that that the 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 sense of uncertainty and risk um, uh, that emancipation entailed sort of makes its way back into our understanding. I hope that people will have a, a renewed sense of the precarity of emancipation and the real threat of reenslavement. That threat didn't go away until December of 1865 with the Thirteenth Amendment, or possibly really the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, because it's the codification of that citizenship that really gives free people the claim they need um, uh, on the United States government um, to their their basic rights. Um, so that's one thing, the sort of precarity of, of emancipation, the, um, the threat of re-enslavement. Um, I also hope that they will gain at least a, a, or think about um, this perennial question that historians are so often returning to, but it's because it's such a rich one, and that is how did slavery end? Um, for a long time, there were kind of these two pitched camps. Was it Lincoln or was it the enslaved themselves? And, and I hope that this book offers a different way of thinking about that question that turns um, the end of slavery into something that involves a cast of thousands, um, that without question, the first steps toward the end of slavery come from the feet of the enslaved, people who had hated slavery all their lives. But if all it took to end slavery was for the enslaved to decide not to be slaves anymore, it would have ended 200 years ago. Um, the, the enslaved are up against enormous structures of power and not until those power, structures of power shifted could slavery end. So I hope people will be challenged to think about emancipation, not as a, um, a not as a who, but a how it ended and to recognize that um, the alliance between the formerly powerless and structures of power is how something like emancipation happens, that that alliance is not perfect by any stretch, but that alliance is, is how the change happens. Um, so those are two things that I hope people will um, think about. Another thing we didn't get to today, but that does, well, we did a little bit, that threads through this book, which is a rich one, and one I don't even know what I think about, but, um, and it is the relationship between civil and military power. I think that that's an underexplored aspect of the Civil War, um, and I'd love it if somebody somewhere thinking, hmm, what should I write about, um, found a way to get at that question, because it affected emancipation for sure, but it affected every aspect of the war. And then finally, um, you know, refugee camps are in our world today, and we sometimes think of them as far away things, but I, I think it's important for us to realize that, that they were right here, they were on US soil. Um, they're a part of the American story. Uh, they affected the outcome of the war. They, um, they, aren't, they aren't distant, they're, they're, they're a very central part of the American story. Yeah, there's a lot of incredible material in, in the book and and you're right we you know we only really scratched the surface um you know over the course of this hour um but 
some of the, one of the things we're very passionate about here at the museum is you know connecting the past to the present, and that's uh, you know such a clear way um, where that's applicable. Um, you know, refugee camps uh, existed during the Civil War here in American soil, and you know they exist uh, you know to this very day. Um, so that that's you know that's that's one very clear way, and then of course the you know the legacies of citizenship and um, well and of course the relationship between civil and military um, you know that's an ongoing relationship. So there, yeah, you sure. know there there are so many ongoing rich um, connections between the Civil War um, and modern times, and that's uh, you know one of the reasons why uh, you know people like you and I still have jobs and you know, exactly. <laughs> We still uh, get to do things like this. So uh, this was a fantastic conversation, Chandra. I, I know I really enjoyed it. And based on the um, the great conversation going on in the comments, I think people watching really did as well. So um, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, you're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, all of you. Thanks for the terrific questions. Um, thanks for some of you to talk about this book with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, happy, happy to provide a, a release in that regard. Um, and if you all out there enjoyed it, and I think you did, um, great way to support the museum, like and share the video, tell your friends about it. That helps us out immensely. Uh, and if you're able to um, become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, memberships as low as $25 a year, it's, you know, two and a half dollars a month or so, less than that. Um, that helps us out, obviously, quite a bit. And thank you to those of you who have joined, um, even just already this year. Um, so we're, we're immensely grateful for that. And I should note, if you missed any of the program, this will continue to live on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. You can go back and watch it from the beginning. Maybe you missed something, you wanna uh, hear it again or pause it and you know write something down, you can do that. So um, this has been fantastic. Uh, we're gonna be coming to you next uh, on Friday. Uh, my colleague Jake is gonna be presenting one of his, uh, his favorite presentations to give, how Civil War medicine killed President James Garfield. Um, so that ought, to, that ought to be a good one. Um, I know I'm looking forward to, to, to tuning in for that. Um, so with all that said, this is uh, John and Chandra signing off. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.